Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Customer Journey Maps, a tool when you want real change. I really want to thank all of our listeners today for dialing in. We're going to get started here just in a minute or two. We have a number of people dialing in. I really want to thank you for your time today. And a most important topic I'm very excited about, not only the guest speaker that we have joining us today, Andrew Schwartz, who I'll be introducing here shortly, but the topic that we're going to be talking about. So we'll start here in just one minute. I want to let people uh, continue to join in. And uh, again, we're going to have, a, I think, a very terrific, insightful discussion around customer journey maps. All right, I have, um, if we could go to the next slide, I just have a couple of housekeeping things, and then I'll introduce uh, execs and own myself. Uh, first of all, for the people that have joined us today, you can connect to the audio in the webinar either through your computer or by calling uh, via in the dial instructions that were emailed to you before uh, the start of the webinar. You also receive a copy of the webinar recording uh, very shortly, so stay tuned. That will come into your uh, email boxes with all of the slides, including today's uh, recorded session. I would ask, I know there's going to be from past participation, there's always lots of questions and input. Thank you for your participation. I am going to ask, we have a lot of data that uh, in, in uh, charts and detail that we're going to be discussing. I just ask that you please save uh, your questions until the end, as there will be a Q&A portion uh, of the webinar during uh, the last 15 minutes. So just a reminder, tomorrow all of you will receive a full recorded copy of the slides and the uh, audio from today's session. All right, if we could go to the next slide, uh, Andrew, help me out on this. Uh, real quick about Execs in the Know, if you're not familiar with us, I would encourage you to uh, get involved. Really, it's been a great advocacy around the customer uh, success and uh, the people that we represent. If I had to say in a nutshell, uh, Execs in the Know is a customer advocacy, advocacy group that's really focused on today's customer executive. Uh, it's really about leaders learning from leaders. Uh, brand sharing best practices uh, directly with each other around uh, multi-channel customer engagement, uh, intersections between customer experience and service delivery, uh, opportunities that really create, I think, uh, best customer experience uh, successes for the brands out there today. If you're not familiar with our website, if you could, go to execsintheno.com. There is some tremendous information that's available to all of our listeners uh, with uh, benchmark reports, uh, insights, and other opportunities uh, that you can find there. Uh, so with that, I, if we could go to the next slide, I want to get started in today's conversation. We've got a lot of uh, great things to share and, and, and talk about as a group. Um, Andrew Schwartz, thank you. Um, I know how busy you are. and. Um, be able to get some of your time on the calendar is just tremendous. And um, what I'd, I'm going to do is uh, share with the audience just a little bit about your background, Andrew. But I'd love you to give a little more flavor if you could, because I know there's a lot of things that you're doing. So for our audience, um, Andrew Schwartz is the Director of Design Research with Sutherland Labs, uh, focusing on customer, or excuse me, and experience research. Um, Andrew has been in the field over 25 years and with his current team for over 15 of those years. Uh, he studied psychology and logistics at Yale University and worked at Apple from 1987 to 1996. And his, uh, I know, Andrew, your journey mapping workshops have been very popular uh, in the U.S. and Europe with executives and practitioners from a wide variety of fields. So I know how lucky we are to have you today, Andrew, and thank you for making some time. Thank you. A um, little bit uh, about my experience. I got started in the research business when I was at Apple. We were working with some of the best designers in the business. And despite that, this is the story of a time we had a bit of a shock. Uh, as you probably know, everything at Apple was carefully designed from the boxes that the products came in to the labels uh, on the boxes to the startup screens and even the manuals. One time we did a study to see how to improve the manuals, and almost as a lark, we decided to do it by going to people's houses. We were curious to see how they had set up their computers, and the plan was to ask them to reenact a real problem they had solved using their manuals. What we found, however, was that no one could remember any such stories, and worse, they'd either thrown away the manuals or they'd left them pristine still in their shrink wrap. 
our surveys and lab studies had never picked this up. It took real eyes on real users in real places to identify the most important finding. That is, that nobody ever uses manuals. And that began the road to where Apple is now, shipping not manuals, but just short little pamphlets. That's one of the two secrets why journey mapping is so popular, at least the way we do it. Journey mapping relies on real-world, hands-on data, which gives realistic insights that everyone agrees on. The other secret is that the analysis seems to bring people from different silos together, rather than mark making them even more entrenched, which sometimes happens with more abstract forms of analysis. Anyway, let's move on to the uh, slides themselves. Just a quick overview of what we're going to be doing in the course of the session today. Uh, I'll do a bit of kind of just brief background so that uh, everybody is up to speed on what journey maps are. But most of the time we'll spend doing a demo, not because you need to be able necessarily to run your own journey mapping, although you can if you want, uh, but mostly because once you see it done once, I think it will give you a sense of when it's useful and how to make it most useful. And we'll also spend some time telling you how to sell journey maps internally within your own organization. And then we'll wrap up by pulling together some of that information into a little getting started section. There will be some audience participation as we go along because that's the very nature of this is that it's a collaborative activity journey mapping. And the way we'll ask you to do it is through the text box in your webinar tool. So please keep that open and your fingers ready on the keyboard. We'll let you know what to do and when. Okay. So first, we just wanted you to, in case you've not actually seen a journey map, they can look lots of different ways, but this is a pretty standard one. We'll dive into the detail of this in a minute, but just wanted you to see it. And wanted you to see a very different journey map as well. On this slide, you can see a journey map of a particular sort called a vision map, uh, which shows, uh, while the first one showed how things are today, this one shows an idea of how a journey might work in the future. So let's have a look at uh, the first journey map again, and let's look at it part by part so that you know what, what the different parts of a journey map are. First, one of the key components is that it's usually built on a timeline from left to right. It's based on a persona. That is, it doesn't try and map everything for everybody. Instead, it picks an important sort of path that a certain sort of customer will take, in this case, uh, somebody who's purchasing a new laptop. It contains horizontal rows called swim lanes, uh, one for each type of activity. They're up there in white and gray. The three activities in this particular journey map are phone, online, and retail, so that the viewer can see how people bounce between different modalities. But it can be different kinds of swim lanes as well, but that's a typical one. And finally, there are swim lanes at the bottom, rows at the bottom, with analysis and recommendations, in this case split up by the relative priority. We want this to be a quick and very practical webinar, and it's going to focus on one key question, which is how does an organization start improving the customer experience by journey mapping? Why journey mapping? Journey mapping is a quick and easy bite-sized step. A little bit more theory. There are many kinds of journey maps. We're going to focus on one, but let's talk about what all journey maps have in common. So they're all presented from the specific point of view, which is typically called a persona. But it could be, so the persona could be one kind of employee, one specific customer, could be a piece of paper, how a piece of paper flows through a system, or a piece of data, or a specific m bit of merchandise. It contains multiple swim lanes, as we discussed a minute ago, and those swim lanes will contain touch points or interactions. So everything somebody might do on the phone, or online, or in retail, or in their living room might be represented by one of the icons in the swim lanes. So there are several different kinds of journey maps. The one that we show here is based on the user experience, but they could equally be based on a process mapping or, as we discussed before, on a future vision uh, of what might happen, which is then called vision mapping. And all three of these can be based on quantitative data, data like analytics, 
qualitative data like user experience or top of the head opinion from experts. In this session, we'll focus on user experience journey maps based on qualitative data. Usually the qualitative data will also be enriched with quantitative and expert perspectives. So there's a reason why people use journey mapping, and it's because it has practical implications. The three we see used most often are that it solves real problems. Journey mapping has a proven history of solving real-world problems for many organizations. One example is we had a client who found a disconnect in their sales process that was hurting sales, causing cancellations. And when they did the journey map, they discovered the solution, and that helped sell that process into their C-suite. It can also open discussions about customer experience. You know, almost every organization exists to provide some service or product for its customers. But sometimes they just get stuck on internal issues. Every part of the organization is focused on solving their little bit of the problem. And they can forget about the impact that all of the pieces have on the final experience. And journey mapping turns out to be really good at focusing people on the whole experience from the customer's eyes. And finally, it can spur innovation. Sometimes the organization gets stuck just thinking about small incremental improvements, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of time saved here, a little bit more efficiency there. But journey mapping is a good way to unleash teams so that they can think about big leaps forward rather than these small incremental improvements. The secret ingredients to journey mapping that can tackle those kinds of problems are real eyes on data and collaboration across the silos during analysis. Real eyes on data, again, means people watching and spending time with real users in the real world, rather than just relying on analytics or focus groups or questionnaires. And the collaboration means a group of people from your organization, facilitated maybe by somebody with an expertise in user experience, will work together to try and develop that journey map. So those are the two things that make journey mapping successful. What I'd like to do now is encourage you to try it with me. In an ideal world, we would send you out into the street now to run a study, but it's not practical in the format of a webinar. So instead, we have a canned uh, set of videos uh, to show you so that you can have that feeling that you've been out to observe real users. The particular example that we want to show you is one of these urban bike schemes. The one that the video was taken um, uh, from is in London. Um, it's a little bit older, uh, and it was done as an independent study that we were just interested in how it would run. These are the kinds of schemes where you can go and without pre-signing up, you can rent a bike, keep it for an hour or two, and then dock it somewhere else in the city and use it instead of the transportation system, instead of a car, or uh, instead of taking a taxi. So suppose your company wanted to take over an existing system like this for a major city. Um, and the interest was you wanted to find what the frustrations were in the current experience, because where there's a frustration, there's an opportunity. And a good place to start with that is a journey map. Remember, journey mapping always starts with real eyes watching real people. The reason why, by the way, is that what people say and what people do and what they say they do are entirely different things. So you could sit down with people, you could send them a questionnaire, but you wouldn't get a true picture of how it works. So since we can't go out and observe, here's a video we made. We'd like you to look at this, and if you wish, you can take notes as you go along, because I'll be asking you for some of your ideas. The video lasts just about three minutes. Um, and uh, uh, the, the sound, it has a little soundtrack and a couple of titles along the way to help you follow along because you won't get as much information as if you were actually doing the study itself. Okay, if we could play that video, please.
Well, I hope that was interesting for you and gave you a sense of how the process of renting and riding a cycle in the London cycle hire system worked. What I'd like to do now is a group exercise. Um, we'll do this by typing rather than by voice and Chad will read out what you type as you do it and I will enter what you type as quickly as I can. Apologies if I don't capture what everybody says. Um, so, but I will type along as you guys um, say it. And the question is, how many types of things needed to be designed? So if you just think about the design task of creating a system like this for scratch, how many different things would need to be well designed in order for the system to work? So I've got a couple of examples down there already, which is printed signs. So somebody needed to design how those printed signs look, what materials they would be on to put them up. And somebody would have had to design the app interface that you saw at the beginning. So what I'd like you now to do is to type in uh, to, the, to the chat box and tell us other ideas of things you noticed that may need to be designed in order to make this system work. And Chad, if you could read those out. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And, and <clears throat> again, audience, if you could just take a minute, go to the chat box there and type in your answers. I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Um, while you're typing, uh, just a reminder for those that may have joined us late, you've been listening to Andrew Schwartz, who is the Director of Design Research for Sutherland Labs. And uh, Andrew's been a fantastic uh, host and guest of uh, our webinar today. So I see a number of uh, responses coming in. Um, again, the question was, uh, Andrew had asked, how many types of things needed to be designed that the customers interact with from the video we've shown? And Andrew, if you're ready, I'm just going to start ahead and reading out uh, one, uh, one says uh, kiosk, kiosk screens uh, was one. So I guess there was different kiosk screens uh, throughout. Cool. Um, Someone noticed a uh, very good uh, observation, uh, the bike docks, uh, where the bikes, I guess, go into and the docks there. Um, a, a card or a key uh, fob for frequent renters. Um, I don't know if there's a different way you want to put that, but a, a card or a key uh, for frequent renters, fob. Very insightful. Our, our uh, listeners, viewers have been watching very intensely. Good job, guys. Um, another one, bike basket. Uh, okay, keep them coming. Uh, bike lanes. Oh, like the um, yeah, uh, like the actual painted lanes on the on the streets. Yeah, uh, I think that, that turned out to be so. quite controversial in London. That's an interesting one. Yeah, um, I got a couple more. Uh, ticket design or printout from the kiosk could be a, an opportunity. Um, another one, uh, system to move bikes around from full areas to empty areas. So something to, I guess, move these bikes around and for, for utilization. And how about locations of kiosks? So assume something like this. Yeah, and I'm gonna give you one more here. Um, street signs for bike pass. Excellent. I think that's a great uh, observation from the team here. So again, thank you to all our uh, viewers and listeners. If that's a great uh, opportunity, so I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew. Thanks. Excellent. What I'd like to do now is building on uh, what we just did. If you look at that list of different ideas of, the, of uh, that list of things that were designed for this system, what I'd like you to think about now is how many different teams it took to create those things. Sometimes it might take multiple teams just to create one of them. So one of, uh, we, we gave as a couple of starting suggestions, for example, first the branding team would have needed to have created the, the branding rule book for creating the signs and probably also the visual elements of the different screens in the app and on the kiosk. There would have needed to have been an app developer to create that app. If you think about your own organization, 
Can you think of the names of other kinds of teams that would be necessary? And again, if you could type that into the chat box, and chat if you could read them out as they come in. Okay, we'll give people a couple of minutes to respond. And again, I know, Andrew, you're asking how many different teams would need uh, would be needed to design the whole end-to-end -end system. Uh, responses are starting to come in. Um, I, there's a response called hardware designers. Um, I guess these would be the docking bays and bikes. So hardware designs or designers. Um, oh, they're coming in. UI, UI design, user, user interface design. Great. Uh, what other types of teams? Uh, logistics teams. I guess, again, logistics to move those bikes around or organize moving those bikes around. Purchasing. Ah, that's a good one. Um, user research. Oh, this is uh, one of my favorite, of course, customer service experience. So customer service, <laughs> customer experience. <laughs> Got to have them on there. We'd be remiss. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, there are a couple more. Legal, of course, legal. Hmm. Would marketing fall under branding team, or would you put marketing as separate, or are they apart? But yeah, marketing was one of the... Well, I think that's a, a fair one, even as a, as a separate one, because they off marketing might take the branding and create mm. its own materials. That's a good point. Um, oh, this is a good one. I didn't think of security. What happens if the bikes are stolen? And I'm just going to give you one more real uh, last one here quickly is uh, public relations for social media. And again, I want to... Audience has been terrific. Thank you for your participation. I know I didn't get them all in there, but uh, for the purpose of today's exercise, there's a great list there of uh, 10 or 12. So, Andrew, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks. Um, so this is uh, uh, kind of some the fundamental foundation of starting to think about why this is important. If you just think about how many different teams, and I'm sure this is only a small portion because we have limited time, but if you think about that, it takes a lot, and you can. Th what we find, and we've been working for years with different companies, um, is that it is rare today that any one team has done a bad job. You know, but we can. We're still familiar, uh, in many instances, of times when every one of these teams could have done a good job, but still they will end up with a system that is somehow difficult or annoying to use for customers. So keeping that in mind. Well, I'd like to move on now to the heart of what journey mapping is like. So this is a journey map. We've, we've filled in most of it, but we've left a key row blank at the moment. This is a simplified journey map for educational purposes. And you can see across the top, you can see icons that represent each of the major stages using the app, going to the kiosk, <coughs> the different parts of the of the journey, the literal journey on the bicycle. And you may notice, for example, that um, some of them are marked in blue or black and some of them are marked in red. The color, I color coding idea of the designers of this was the parts of the journey that were less workable, that made people less happy are done in red. And it also shows uh, in terms of the height of the dots. So the trip to as far as Covent Garden was very nice. But once they arrived at Victoria Station, it was, a, it was a poor experience because the biking dock was full, you probably noticed. You may notice that uh, it's divided up into seven columns. Uh, and this would have been done in the course of collaboration among many analysts in, a, in the room. And the particular way the rows are divided in this, in this example, is a common one done in many journey maps, which is the division between external, front stage, and backstage. The external swim lane is the parts of the experience the user sees directly with their own eyes. <coughs> the middle swim lane, the front stage, contains touch points that the customer can see, but that are actually handled by the service provider. 
and the backstage are the parts that the customer may not even know about, like the maintenance of the bikes and the docking station. So again, typically this would be developed by a variety of people in the room. But the part that gets people the most engaged is this bottom row called opportunities. And as a final exercise, I'd like to get people to contribute their ideas about um, opportunities for improvement, so the problems that you noticed and possibly some solutions as well. Um, this is interesting for us because almost every time we do this, uh, and we've done it quite a few times, this particular exercise, every group has got a different take on what to do and the brilliant ideas have come through. So that's your challenge. If you wouldn't mind one last time typing into your text box and giving us ideas. If you could also, um, uh, before you start typing, if you could tell us which column you're referring to when you give us an idea. So if you have an idea about how to deal with obstacles on the route, you could type four and then write down the idea. So Chad, if you could read things out as they go, I'm going to open up a version of this that I can type into. Okay, very good. Um, also, I just want to, while we're typing about opportunities and the different uh, swim lanes that uh, are identified in this particular map, um, I do know there's a number of general questions that have been coming in. Thank you. We will uh, get to your questions towards the end of today's webinar. So, uh, again, I will definitely make time for your questions at the end. So, Andrew, just as a quick reminder, as everyone's typing in, you're looking for opportunities in this uh, areas that uh, they may be able to uh, identify in this particular map. That's exactly right. Okay. Well, I'm going to start reading some out. A couple have come in. Uh, for example, I think number it's uh, one. Uh, I guess phase one or opportunity or the swim lane one. Uh, know where the open slots for bikes are and reserve them. Do you have any ah. comment on that one? So that was clearly a um, uh, that was a frustration at the end that they didn't have a um, a slot to return their bike into. So this is an interesting idea to be able to reserve at the beginning of your trip a spot at the end of the trip, so you know that you'll be able to leave the bike. There's an open spot in the destination rack. I hope that summarizes it. Yeah, and very observant of uh, the viewer today, so thank you for that. Um, another one just came in. I guess this would be in six, other docking station found. Uh, it said, get staff to clear bikes from full docks based on uh, whatever data from the docks. Um, so get staff to clear bikes from full docks and maybe uh, move them around? Based, based on data from the docks staff can uh, try to short I, a long comment but maybe uh, try to shorten it there for you great so this is uh, this is what you've been looking for and again uh, continue to think through this uh, list uh, for our viewers here today uh, I think Jeff just provided one he said in number three riding the bike um, provide voice directions on an app that's terrific I like that one too Excellent. So try to, it sounds like it's good for people to have directions. Tourists do use these things. And the, uh, the insight here is that you don't want people to be looking down at their phone at a map. You want them to be able to pick it up on their ear, earbuds. Um, seven, running to the station, uh, we had a suggestion, e-coupon for free on-trade coffee if you ran into a full dock. That's a great experience. I get a free coffee because of my the frustration I just had. <laughs> I like that one. I love that. Uh, another one in seven there would have been um, info on which track the trains are on. So running to the station, maybe some info on which track the trains are on. Cool. Got some more? Do you want to keep going? Yeah, let's see if we can't uh, uh, fill up some of these columns. Well, let's go to, um, let's try finding the kiosk one came in. Uh, location, um, aware app, so don't need to have an unlock code from the kiosk. So I don't know how you'd like to summarize that, but 
an aware yeah. app, so you don't need to have unlo well location. This is in two uh, location, and it says aware app, so you don't need to have an unlock code from kiosk. Ah, uh, so I, I could use the app to unlock the bike rather than uh, have to go to the kiosk. Yeah, okay. unlock. Were there any others? Uh, uh, yeah, we have a few more. Uh, number uh, three, I guess, was riding the bike. We had a minimum max speed alert. I assume this means something like show the speed limit. Yeah. Uh, I think another great suggestion in one uh, came in from Chuck would be post videos on how to ride a bike safely. I know that may sound sounds straightforward, but you know you never know, and uh, there could be differences with this particular bike or area. Good point, especially since it's used by tourists as well. Yeah. Uh, the rules may differ, I imagine, from city to city. Uh, I guess this would go under one, two, uh, a prepaid bike passcode text, so you don't need to stop at the kiosk or some sort of prepay. Uh, prepaid bike passcode? Bike. Uh, and get was this a get the um, passcode uh, by text? Yeah, text. So you don't need to stop at the kiosk. Great. I got a couple on five. Uh, I'd like to fill in. Uh, so we we're hearing from every one of these from the audience here. Uh, Jenny said, uh, number five, a GPS system that would lead you to the closest available dock. So you don't get stuck at a dock that's already full. It'll take you to a, to the, to a dock that's got some spaces. That'd be that's very nice. helpful. Uh, somewhat similar, number five, uh, but again, know where the open slots are. Cool. Um, I'm just looking through. There've been lots of response. I'm a. Here's one I found for. Uh, again, from Mike. He said number four. Uh, integrate traffic from Google Maps into the app for route information. So integrate traffic from Google Maps into the app for route information. into the app. Yeah, that makes sense. Nice. Now we have well, I more. See we've got, you, or you want to keep um, going? We've got some good coverage. Uh, so apologies to anyone whose input we didn't get time for. But one of the things we wanted you to see is there are some novel and interesting ideas here that could have a big impact on the user experience. And of course, coming up with ideas is different than implementing them. It's different from rolling them out, and it's different from making people happy. But this is the beginning of the system, and this is what really happens in the room. And what's nice is you often get people making suggestions for areas that may not be their primary responsibility. But because everybody has seen the same data at the same time, there's not the kind of defensiveness you get at other meetings where people are saying, you need to do this better, you need to do that better. Instead, it feels like a team themselves trying to come up with a plan. And the focus is on the user's experience at this stage rather than the implementation, which tends to soften things. So having finished that, let me give you just a couple of tips. So. Again, the key value for most um, journey mapping projects is to start with real eyes watching real people. That's how you bring your team together so that it's not theoretical and so that there's some room for surprise. If you remember the story I told before we started the slides about how when we were at Apple, the big surprise, which we'd never seen in the lab, was that people didn't use their manuals. But of course, in the lab, we had the manual there and we told them to use it. So when you have real eyes on real people, you have a chance to see the surprising results. And then you want to involve your own internal clients in the analysis at whatever level works within your organization. 
the greatest value comes when they're discussing these issues. Um, if you handed them a beautiful journey map, it might go on, even go on the wall in the best case, but chances are it would not be internalized. If you want the journey map to do some real work, you need to work on it together and discuss. I'd like to turn to the third section of the report now, um, where we're going to tell you about how to sell journey maps within your organization. So, I've shown you a number of ways in which it can be useful, and hopefully you can see that it's fun. The reason why we try to make it fun with an organization is because they, uh, when it's fun, it enters the consciousness and it knocks down defensiveness. The question for this section is, how do you get your own organization interested? So I want to tell you four, um, four points at which organizations managed to talk themselves into doing this work. For one technical company, they actually started with a real life problem and they were curious about how to solve it. This is that problem I referred to before that they had. Uh, it turned out they had um, a lot of people canceling orders, and this didn't appear on any of their indexes of c consumer happiness or any of the analytics about how people, w the moment when people place the order, and they were really flummoxed about how this had happened. So they did a journey mapping of the customer experience, and then they did analysis underneath it uh, to determine what was happening behind the scenes and putting those two things together. They figured out a new security protocol had, had messed up the customer experience and then were able to eliminate that. A second example, um, there was a large U.S. organization involved in tourism and they used journey mapping to show how to improve their back office approach to improve the customer's reservation experience. So this is, was pretty interesting because they worked on the back office approach by itself a number of times. But because in those times it was not attached to what the customer was experiencing, they couldn't figure out what they needed to do to move into a 21st century approach. It was the journey mapping that opened their eyes. In a third one, there was a desire to improve the patient experience. There were a lot of hypotheses from a lot of very bright people and they didn't know which ones would fit. So they sent ethnographers to actually sit in waiting rooms and emergency rooms and watch how people work. And they figured out what could fit and what, what would actually make people more miserable. And there were a number of surprises in the course of that. Um, there was a pet shop that had a desire to start moving more and more services online where possible which is interesting because pets are a very physical thing, pet grooming is a very physical thing, but how there were components of it which could go online and components which didn't. People are very emotional about their pets and journey mapping helped show uh, how, that could, how that could fall out. So look for this kind of thing. Look for a real problem, look for a real ambition, look for a place where you need to map what's going on in the back office to what's happening in the customer experience. Those are the places where journey mapping can be a good first step. If you want to initiate a conversation in your company, here's three good questions to, to ask yourself and ask your teams, ask your colleagues. The first is, does your company get much of a chance to see your customers using your products in the real world? If the answer is no, journey mapping is a great first task to get a group focused on useful observation. What you want to avoid is an academic exercise where you just watch people and then you report back. The journey mapping is a good focused exercise with a real deliverable at the end that can help people create a vision. The second question is, are there any user experience issues that you think could, you could fix if only you could get the people in your company to talk to each other? Well, because journey mapping is designed to expose uh, exactly that kind of issue. So if you have a bunch of people who are involved in different silos on the same experience, journey mapping shows them how they fit together. And finally, does your company have an innovation strategy? If not, Journey mapping is good. Innovation is really difficult 
and journey mapping is a good entry level bite size activity. Uh, if you're curious how long a typical journey mapping project uh, lasts, it's typically about an eight week process. It can be compressed um, by uh, uh, bringing in the analysis stage, bringing more people into analysis, and sometimes it can go longer depending on how many different groups of users you would like to study. But eight weeks is a good benchmark. And finally, we'd like to talk about uh, bring some of these observations together and talk about how to get started. The first step is to identify target projects. Um, you might want to look at products or services and whether or not they fit any of the models on the real life example slide where we have four examples or initiate discussions through the three questions slide. Um, and then you might want to decide whether to do the work in-house or whether to outsource some or all of the work. If you have an experienced research team internally, they probably know how to do journey mapping and you can encourage them to do this. Um, if not, you can do some of the work internally but may wish to outsource certain aspects of it, like recruitment. Um, we'll have some resources coming up on the next slide that will help you decide how to do this on your own. But even if you do outsource it, you should strongly consider involving your teams during the analysis phase. One of the things you should ask the teams who you want to outsource it to is whether or not they plan on doing all of it or whether or not they have ways of involving your teams so that they can see the results of the research and then help decide on the future opportunities. The particular resources that you might find nice to start with. Um, in terms of figuring out how to actually go out and use real eyes to observe real users, this book, How to Be an Explorer of the World, will give you, uh, it's a handbook of, of different exercises that you can do, ranging from very small scale to much larger scale. It's a lovely book and very engaging. We also have a free pamphlet that, that we've written called Top Tips on Successful Journey Mapping, written by my colleague Simon Hurd. Um, and it's, uh, it's short and to the point and has a lot of very practical advice and that can be received from the uh, URL at the bottom there which will be on the slides that you can receive uh, tomorrow. That's it for the presentation itself. We've got a few minutes left over for questions. Uh, if you could type your questions in and I think Chad may have already received some of these. Uh, if you could type those questions into the text box uh, I'll do my best to answer them for you now. Yes, and thank you, Andrew. If you could take a minute. Uh, I know there's a, a questions already have come in, and I'm sure there's more still coming in. Andrew, I just want to comment on a couple of things before I get into some questions. First of all, great presentation. Uh, true gentleman, I, I like the way you took this whole conversation, because sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming or complex, and at the same point, uh, uh, many other pieces. And I think you've given us a lot of great references to uh, how to start things consider approach and ensure a successful uh, outcome. One thing I hear a lot, Andrew, just more of a commentary from the community is that not necessarily that journey maps are something new per se for the CX executives uh, and service experts, but uh, sometimes uh, they just don't they, they die on the vine or they don't get implemented or they kind of get dust on them and, and I think sometimes maybe we try to uh, overstate and, and um, not simplify some of those journeys and really look from, I think in the beginning you said from the, from real eyes, real eyes and real people and the exercise you took us through, uh, there were some things that uh, just watching that video uh, that the audience had some great suggestions that, you know, me as an individual I didn't see but I saw it a certain way and um, so my commentary there is uh, uh, we want to be successful with this process, Andrew. Um, and I think you've done a terrific job of giving us some ideas. I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments about what I just said, but uh, uh, it is something that does take commitment, effort, and uh, it's an ongoing piece. Uh, that's a good point. You know, there are, there are dozens of different techniques for doing experience research, but uh, the ones that we've gone over today, there's a smooth on-ramp for it. It's a proven way of getting started. But more than just getting started, it seems to be the one that, especially for organizations that are still ramping up, it seems to be the one that gets real effects done at the end. 
So uh, if, if you're the person fighting that battle in your company and you want a quick win, Journey Maps is a great place to start. It doesn't mean that your organization is going to transform overnight, but each stage creates momentum for the next stage. And in human terms, that's what gets you there in the end. No, well said. And I'm glad, Andrew, you have your email address for our audience there. Do make note of Andrew's uh, email address. Uh, I kind of see you as a resident expert in this area, so Andrew, a uh, pleasure to have you. Um, let's get to uh, some questions. Uh, Dennis is asking, uh, Andrew, uh, in my company, we've done journey mapping more quickly by bringing in our um, own analytics team and I guess some business process experts. Uh, the question, as I read here, Dennis, is that do you have any thoughts on that? Is there is it a problem not to do the observation part? Um, so kind of a comment and then a question, Do you, if you need to repeat, but uh, if you could help Dennis out. Sure. Let me see if I can recap. Uh, Dennis, I think what you're asking is um, uh, can you just bring the experts into the room and create the journey map based on their experience and based on what you've learned through analytics? Well, I'll tell you that that's probably the most often con way that journey maps are conducted. The only problem we find is that it tends to recreate the opinions that created the problems in, this, in the first place. People will already know what the, what the analytics say typically, and the experts, the internal experts, will be the same ones that have helped to create the systems. So there's no new data, there's no new vision, and sometimes uh, it, it can reinforce the current thinking. So if what the reason why you're doing the journey mapping is to break out of a set of problems or to innovate uh, uh, new products and features, the way to do that is to bring in new data and to look at things through your customer's eyes. It's well worth the, the effort, it's not particularly expensive, and it will energize your teams. Great response. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Jeff is asking, Andrew, um, Jeff's asking, how did you capture motion for the journey mapping for the urban, urban bike example? So how did you <laughs> capture emotion? Um, I think what, what uh, Jeff, was, uh, Jeff was referring to, um, and I don't know if everybody noticed it, but in the video we watched, there was a little bar graph to the right that went from a frowny face to a smiley face. And during different parts of the journey, you could see the LEDs light up more towards the smiley face or more towards the frowny face. So that is an animation that we created post hoc uh, after the event. Um, it can be done in a variety of ways, uh, from attaching electrodes to people and recording galvanic skin resistance uh, so you can see what the tension level is at a particular moment. You can conduct ongoing interviews during a process what we did for this particular study is we uh, strapped GoPros onto the heads of riders and then we showed them their video back and interviewed them. We didn't really want to have electrodes going over people in traffic in case a wire got snagged. Um, and of course we didn't want to conduct interviews during the, con during the session itself because we thought that would be very distracting and they wouldn't be able to concentrate on traffic. So and then we, we um, uh, hand drew in effectively the um, the little chart on the right hand side of the video. That's uh, Jeff, that was very uh, observatory on your part to see that piece and I'm going to watch the video over again now to catch that but uh, kudos to that and kudos to your guys' creativity the way you approached it Andrew. Yeah, sure. Um, got a couple more coming in. Um, Earl, I know you've been wanting to get this question asked. Um, Earl saying that um, we have a general consumer app, um, but how do you capture the journeys for the larger variety of customers we have? Um, so, you know, how would you capture these journeys for a larger variety of consumers on their, I guess, their consumer app? Yeah, so the temptation uh, Earl, it's a good question because it comes up at the beginning of most new projects. The temptation is to be comprehensive in your journey map to include all the different ways that people might go through the system. Um, and you can picture for any complex consumer app, a retail journey or even setting up, say, a smart home thermostat, there's so many ways of doing things. The idea of journey mapping is not an academic exercise, it's to actually communicate with your own team and develop new ideas. 
And the one thing we've discovered in the years of doing this is that simpler is better. So for each journey map, we select one person doing one journey. We pick that person. That It's not typically a real person. It's a persona representing an important category of user. Uh, we take that one person's journey uh, and a, a, the, an important way that they go through that rather than each branch they might take. We might do two or three optional branches and we might do two or three journey maps, but the idea is simplify and focus on the important case. Sometimes the important case is the biggest, most representative, and sometimes it represents a new ambition um, or an edge case which is increasingly important. Very good. Well, you, uh, Andrew, Stacy needs some help. Um, is she kind of alluding to a little bit about, I think what I said uh, was we opened up the Q&A and some observations. So um, I'll just read what she says word for word here. Uh, Andrew, any hints on how to get the results to be taken seriously? We've commissioned some journey mapping, and a few teams took up the recommendations, but mainly they gathered dust. Please help. Yeah. <laughs> So here's practical advice. Involve the people who will need to implement the, at the end somebody's going to have to implement this and you have to identify which teams and which decision makers that will be and involve them from the beginning and throughout the process. Get them invested in it and listen to what they have to say. There may be reasons why certain ideas are not implementable. Um, and it's not worth spending a lot of time journey mapping to that end. So at the beginning, involve them in helping to set the research questions and the research protocol. Uh, during the data gathering, if it's possible to observe the data directly, invite them along. And if not, send them summaries of interesting findings as it's going along. And then during the analysis phase, make sure they're in the room. It's very hard for people to ignore what's happening if they've been part of the process from the beginning. That's our number one tip. Very good. Andrew, you've been, you're in high demand, and I know we're not going to get all these questions answered today. Um, I'm going to take uh, one or two more, and that'll be it for our time. But uh, again, for our listeners, viewers, um, Andrew, I'm sure you're very much open to people reaching out directly on email, andrew at sutherlandlabs.com. Uh, by the way, as uh, Andrew, you know, Sutherland has been a terrific partner for execs in the know, really helping our community advocate customer success and advance this industry as a whole. So uh, again, uh, for all the questions I can't get to today, uh, please reach out to Andrew directly, and uh, I'm sure Andrew will be happy to uh, uh, respond to you. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to get your I'm going to get your question in here. Uh, Lisa is asking, how do you determine what the beginning and end of the journey should be? Does it start when they start using our app? Huh. That's a great question. The um, uh, probably the the most common mistake made, and we did this at the beginning too, which is there'll be some part of the journey for which you are inherently responsible. So if you're an app creator, it's when people open your app and you consider the journey done when they close your app. But it turns out that it's much more illuminating to start at least one step before that and continue one step after that. The reason why is not, um, so if you picture, uh, uh, let's say an app to book a, a train journey, um, what's interesting, uh, so, so rather than start it at the moment they tap the icon for your app, start it with their motivation, maybe a little bit about their journey and deciding to do it and why they chose to do it on an app rather than through other places. It helps set the context and the motivation so that the rest makes a bit more sense. And then continue past the, um, the time when they've closed the app. So say they've bought their train ticket and the next step is they go to the train station uh, and they're, they're confused about where they actually pick up their, their ticket. Um, what would be nice is once the train journey is well underway, that's the moment when you can let go. By the way, if you look at the history of any of the services your company has done, or if you think about where you've been a customer, there's a good chance that the way they've expanded their business over time electronically is by beginning to own a little bit more of what happens earlier in the process and own a little bit more of what happens later in the process. So if you're trying to get a vision of where things can go, starting the journey earlier on the journey map and finishing it later is a great way to future proof. 
Well, very good. And I'm going to, I know I got a couple closing slides, but I want to just close with you, Andrew, on this before we move to those slides. Um, first of all, Andrew, you've been a terrific uh, guest, and thank you so much. Uh, as I said many times throughout uh, the session today, it's, uh, I think you're one of the top minds and uh, industry experts when it comes to journey mapping and many other aspects of customer engagement. Um, Andrew, I'm, I think it goes without saying you would be very open to anyone directly directly reaching out, you'd be more than happy to help out in any shape, fashion, or form. Um, and I would encourage you uh, from today's session, if we couldn't get all the questions answered, uh, please do reach out to uh, Andrew directly. My last comment and question before we move to the, the closing slides are, um, Andrew, any, uh, I know there's been a lot of things shared here, but um, last thoughts, words of wisdom, motivation uh, as we get into this, but uh, I, I know we all want the right outcome. Our intents are always uh, very well meant, but at the end of the day, we do care about our customers. We do care about their success. And um, I don't know if there's been any observations you've had over the years with the many clients you've worked with, but if there's any parting comments or last thoughts for us here, I'd, I'd welcome them from your expertise. Maybe I'll make them very short, which is to say, just start. Do whatever you can to start seeing your users. If you haven't done it in your organizations yet, if you're new to your organization, you're experts in the industry already, and you probably know this, but nothing speaks more loudly than the first study, which shows people how people, how your customers actually interact with your products. It is extremely encouraging, and nothing is more encouraging than seeing your users succeed or fail. So take that first step. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow, you will receive an email uh, from Exec to the Know on today's session and recording and all the slides that were there. I'd encourage you to share it within your peer group and uh, your network. I think there were a lot of very useful and helpful insights that were presented uh, from today's session. Andrew, I had a lot of fun today. Thank you again. Um, I want to say for our listeners, uh, Exec to the Know, we do host twice a year our a leadership executive form, the Customer Response Summit. We're going to be in Las Vegas, February 6th through 8th. I would strongly encourage you to come out and attend. It's two days of insightful, fact-filled, uh, you name it, everything around best customer engagement strategies. Uh, our website, execsintheno.com, will have for, uh, more details uh, on the summit coming up, and I hope that you will decide to join us. So on behalf of Execs in the Know and Andrew from Cutlearn Labs, I really want to say thank you so much for today's session. We are now going to conclude. Everyone have a fantastic day. Enjoy uh, the upcoming holidays, and thank you so much again for your participation. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.